And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, John Spencer. You'll see that he wasn't mentioned in the um, introductory years of Euphora, but um, when he did uh, come to us, he has been a very valued member. Um, he's been a chairman of Bufora. Um, although he's an accountant, he's found, he's found time to write a number of uh, books on paranormal subjects, um, including several on UFOs. Um, probably one of his more controversial books was Perspectives about the Alien Abduction Syndrome. Um, I have on sale instead on my bookstall UFO Encyclopedia, so that shows you how deeply he's been into the subject. Um, he's also involved with uh, various um, organisations in the media, he's been on TV. Um, I think he gives some jolly good talks and uh, he's going to talk to you today about his uh, 10 best cases, if I've got it right. And it's my great pleasure to hand you over to John Spencer to talk about um, your dozen best cases, is that right? Top ten. Thank you. Handing out the leaflets is the kind of audition we give every speaker, so that's okay, that's fine. So I hope I pass that part of it. And I'll just have to get this back in focus for when I need it, so if just give me one second. That's actually you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, now, why my, my top ten? Um, really, I've, I've taken on this as a, a kind of a reaction to what's going on in the media particularly and, and in the scientific community. There are many radio debates on when I go on radio and do shows and so on. Um, I'm often told, you're a dinosaur. Your subject is now dead. And uh, indeed, at the uh, unconvention, not the last one, but the one before that, there was a debate on ufology being dead. Um, you'll have noticed there's a lot of programmes, I think there was one on TV last night, showing how to expose the, the psychics, the frauds, to show that the, the whole of the psychic phenomena is simply fraud, that you can do it all with mirrors and smoke and tricks. Uh, Professor Richard Dawkins is leading a, a promotion of science. And this is not an attack on science, but I think science has to be seen always as a tool of society and it is fast becoming a fundamentalist religion at the moment so this is not to suggest that science does not have its place or, or, or is not the proper way for an approach to our subject to be made not at all before it insists on its own scientific principles but science has a place rather than being its own own religion and so on and um, so these cases are simply there to show that this work is valuable, that it is ongoing, and that there are topics in the paranormal, like ufology, which are not dead, far from dead. And I always go back to a scientist when I'm unsure about the, the, the best quote for this kind of fight, if you want to call it that, and that's the one that was mentioned by Lionel, Professor J. Allen Hynek, who was the leading ufologist in America for a long time. Uh, I see the Hynek UFO report book is right there for anyone that wants hold of it. And he said, when people, and I'm more or less quoting you exactly, when people talk about science, or uh, 20th century science, they forget that one day there will be a 21st century science, a 30th century, and a 40th century science, from which perspective the world will look very different. And I think the, the sort of research we do is about trying to bring that science forward in our subjects at least. Now it's difficult to pick top cases. I've picked these ones not because they're probably the best cases in the subject, or certainly not the most exotic cases in the subject, but because they are cases which have something which I think really still raises a question for researchers, for science, for anyone to look at. I believe they all prove something. They may not be objectively the best. You'd have to make your own mind up about that. So. I've gone beyond just UFO and abduction cases for several reasons, although there are three specific UFO and abduction cases in this tent. But because the field itself since 1947, since the days that Lionel was talking about earlier on, has opened up very broadly. It's opened up far more through the abductions into fields which are certainly em embracing the paranormal. Very little UFO research now can avoid looking into the paranormal areas and for example the work of people like John Mack in, in the States where he's doing very um, sort of intensive work with uh, 
close encounter and abduction researchers is also looking into other aspects such as kind of reincarnation areas, others have looked at shamanic journeys and near death and so on. So any modern analysis of the UFO field needs to involve other paranormal subjects, which is why I've broadened broaden this out. Also because these cases have great similarity in, in certain aspects. They arise spontaneously, they usually have fairly short duration, they leave ambiguous if any traces. Um, the investigation techniques that ufology brings to bear is very similar to that in looking at ghosts or poltergeists or whatever. And in most <coughs> cases we are investigating not the thing itself, not the flying saucer or whatever, but the person, the witness. And, and uh, therefore I think there's, there's a sort of a great relevance in the, the broadness of it. What I'm going to cover is two CE3 abduction cases, astigmatic and exorcism, a created ghost, and no, it's not the Canadian Philip, um, because I think they will all prove something here. Uh, I'm going to bring in an instrumentation case, just because it's really quite weird. Um, a ghost, a poltergeist, and a straight UFO, because I think they quite simply prove there is a reality here for us to be examining. And one very strange case, which I'll, I'll kind of share with you, particularly if we have a little time at the end. Now, the, the first of these is the chap called Peter. Peter basically had, he was about six, uh, 14 years old in 73 when he had two experiences. The first one was just a sighting. He arrived home to Toby Barnett. He and his father stopped the car, looked up in the sky, and they saw a UFO. They saw an object they couldn't identify. It was moving very strangely, um, not particularly pulsating. They didn't know exactly what it was. They couldn't identify it. They said it was something bigger than a two-pence piece at arm's length, which is actually quite, quite large in the sky. Um, now, very shortly after that, there was no identification of that. It was, in, it was examined. A few guesses were given, but no one could identify quite what it was. More importantly, I think, in this case, the second incident took place similar sort of time, Peter was in bed 3 o'clock in the morning, he got out of bed and pulled the curtains open and he had a feeling that he had to do it, that he knew something was there and so on and the way he described it, he said it, it wasn't, he saw a huge light as it were outside the window, but he also described the fact that the window was no longer there, the light was just engulfing him and so on. And he looked through it and he could see into the core of the light, as if it was kind of turning independently. And he could see forms inside the light and so on. Totally filled his, his field of vision. Then the whole image seemed to implode, he said, that's his word, and it became tiny and it disappeared and he was actually looking through his window. He was, as it were, back to normal. He went back to bed, went back to sleep, and his father later confirmed, when I was talking to the two of them, that he actually slept solid for 26 hours shortly after that. I also spoke to his sister, who had had something very similar happen to her around about the same sort of time. It very mirrors the, uh, a lot of American research that suggests that these things can happen within family groups and so on, bloodlines, whatever. The point of the case really is not so much what happened to them, but it's two things. One is that Peter suddenly flared up as an artist. Not just an artist who desired to be an artist, but one with incredible talent and makes his living now, in fact, as an artist. But it's his belief that the two were linked, that his artistry came from this experience. Basically, he paints a lot of pictures of which this is a black and white, unfortunately, but that was colour picture. He did one of the forms that he thinks he saw inside the um, uh, light. He's done a lot of other pictures, a lot with religious imagery, with crosses and so on all kind of driven by this experience, he thinks. The experience certainly seems to be his trigger. He certainly acquired an artistic talent. He didn't have it before. It was a gardener before. He sort of does some gardening, and, but he's actually moved over the kind of landscape work, more creative work. But mostly he's now an artist, and he, and he sells his paintings and makes his own <coughs> as an artist. Um, the point about that really is he's not the only one. In all the close encounter of witnesses I've seen, a high proportion, a very high proportion, have been switched on in some way by this experience towards a form of talent, whether it's artistry, painting, sculpting, music, etc. Some kind of drive towards an artistic expression. Um, now, that, for me, is, is in a sense the so what. 
because here you have a large group of people, Ameri I mean, across the world, America, England, across Europe and Scandinavia that I've interviewed, where this common effect has happened. They've been switched on. Now, the why is, it is important. It's very much important. But it's not a question of, of looking for an identification to this. It could be, some would believe, that the aliens are triggering certain people, certain bloodlines and so on, and saying, we'll turn them into special people for whatever reason. Personally, I don't particularly believe that, but I also have no proof it couldn't be true either. What I think happens, and what is important here, for me, in, in my analysis, is that the right brain is being triggered by these experiences. We basically live in the left brain in our society. The rational, I mean, I'm using these very conventional left brain. I know that's kind of <coughs> outmoded, but let's stick with it for the simple description. Left brain, very scientific, very rational, very um, measuring, calculating. The right brain, intuitive, artistic, uh, creative, and so on. We mostly live in our left brain. Society teaches us to live in our left brain. Our schools teach us in a way which develops the left brain and actually perhaps teaches us very badly in the sense that it almost cripples us because the right brain is very, very clever when it's activated. And I think when you have these experiences, which most people who have them, they may describe them as awe-inspiring, they may describe them as the most wonderful things, there is usually some element of, if not fear, um, kind of apprehension as to at least what are they getting into, because there is no model in their world to, ex to, to accept these experiences. I think the whole brain just turns on as a kind of, let's see what we've got in here that might help out in this problem. And I think with these people, once it's triggered, they like it, so they can develop it. Some people will, will leave it and, and will not develop it. Most, it, it lasts for a good year or so afterwards. For some people, it becomes their life. And I think what this is revealing and why research in these subjects is important, apart from the possibility of alien intervention, dimensional intervention, or whatever else, is that we do have abilities in our brains which clearly something can inspire, clearly we can change the way we see the world or act in the world or do what we want to do. And so long as that is true, research into these areas should be furthered, which is why I think you won't get great research in that outside of paranormal research. I don't think we're not seeing it. In, in the paranormal research, we see very good research here in that area. So we're looking at, does the brain do things differently? And many of my, my, my kind of studies on this have been looking not, not so much at what the external influence is, but what is it that happens to us. This case, for me, proves that there is something we can do better if we could learn to do things differently, and at the moment only being triggered by um, an external source of some sort, whatever it may be. The next case that I picked is a fairly classic abduction. It took place in Sweden. Um, it's, it was written up in a book, uh, I think Lionel mentioned Perspectives, and it was the kind of key case around the book Perspectives. And the point about it was the bare bones of it were very, very similar to what you might call the role model classic abduction. Um, lone witness out on the fields at night, very, very bright light in the sky, object seen above, whatever. The light encased the witness. The witness believes he was kind of hoovered up into the, the object. Um, there he met the beings on board or whatever, had some kind of interaction with them, and was then dropped off later on, as it were. Now that's a very, very simplistic, classical model of sort of Betty Barney Hill and many, many abductions since. The point about this one, and then actually, uh, just to say it, there is one of the few cases that actually seem to have a witness. Uh, abduction cases are very rarely witnessed. Unfortunately, the abduction was not witnessed, so it's not that good. But um, you do have a case of someone who had reported this cone of light hitting the ground at the time when, when he was hoovered up. So you had some kind of witness, at least to that. And as I say, the point is it's very, very similar to the American case. What is important it, for me in this is that the case was investigated totally differently to the way that at that time, particularly, cases were being investigated. The model investigation was very simple. The investigator would go to the person, would take down all the details of what they reported and so on. They would try and guess the size of the object from just holding up two pennies to the arm's length and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there was a certain acceptance that you had an alien intervention, that you had the kind of medical examination and so on. This was not the way this was investigated. It was investigated by, for what want of a simple word you could have, was new agers. They got hold of the case, they looked at it from the point of view of 
Um, the fact that they could find doused energy lines at the exact point of the abduction, and I mean to within inches, not to within feet or miles or something, to within inches, in the area where the abduction took place, there were all these kind of runic stones. Uh, this is in, in Scandinavia, so. Um, there was a whole kind of thing in, in, the, in Anders' mind, in the witness's mind, about how he had been, something had been implanted into his brain. Now, we talk a lot about implants, and I know one of the speakers today will be talking a great deal about his work on implants. In this case, they were talking more about a kind of psychic implant, in that sense, and, of course, in the American models, a lot of talk about this is to tag us or to control our psychic powers or whatever else. In this case, what he felt it was doing, it was connecting him to the Earth. It was a very Gaia-like concept. Now, I'm not, for a minute, suggesting that this case is better researched or that these conclusions are more important than the American conclusions or anything of the sort. Nothing of the sort. What it proves, I think, is that very, very similar cases can have very different conclusions if you approach them in a very different way. And I actually do like this case in the sense that it was one of the first that I called witness-driven. It wasn't a case of the researcher having great knowledge and going to the witness and saying, I'm the expert, if you tell me what it is, I'll tell you what it was. Instead of that, it was people saying, actually, you're the only one that was there, you're the only one that really knows, you've just got to tell us what it is, and we're not going to impose anything on that, and as far as I can see, the researchers there, as best they could, did not impose their view of the world, they just took his view, and it suggests, therefore, that these abductions, these close encounters, may be a bit more complex than we think. They don't necessarily have to fit into this very, very generic sort of model that's going around. But in fact, something very complex is going on, and the way we approach it gets to that degree of complexity. I think it's important that we do continue to be very open-minded and very broad-minded about the way we research these subjects in order to find out a bit more about what's really going on there. It's very tempting to take the sort of Bud Hopkins model, and I'm not decrying Bud at all, I know him very well, but, but he has a very clear model about what he believes happens. Most of his witnesses tend to show that that is what happened to them, and I have a feeling that in those circumstances what might be happening is that he may be influencing the investigation. Now that's... I, I'll take one, but I will take them at the end, but I'll take one if it's kind of you know, really I'm burning new, there. I'm new to this. Is, sure. Are there any tests ever done, or regularly done, on people to see whether they're telling the truth, i.e. psychometric testing or character testing? Sure. There are many, many tests that are done. Um, all of those kinds of things you're talking about have been done also on people who have not been abducted to find out whether or not they can come up with the same experiences. There was an experiment called the Imaginary Abductees, where they took people and told them to fake it, just to see whether they would come up with the same kinds of story. And of course, strongly used in the subject is hypnosis. And for some people, they believe that hypnosis gets through all the filters and gets to the real truth. And a lot of others, including myself, I must put my cards on the table, believe that hypnosis is probably the greatest mixer-up of, of, of truth. You know, you bring out what the person fears or believes or whatever, not necessarily what actually happened. But certainly there's a great deal of effort goes into the subject to verify the witnesses, to verify the population as a whole, as a comparison to and so on. So yes, I mean, quite, a, quite a lot. So, um, so that is, that's why I've, I've included that case in my group, simply because I think that case shows that a different approach can have a different result. It doesn't mean there isn't something very, very important going on. In fact, I think it means there is. But we need to be cautious about how we interpret it. My next one, we will come away from UFOs for a bit and come to a stigmatic. And again, because it proves something. Basically, this stigmatic, her name was Heather Woods, she was quite a famous uh, stigmatic at the time, a few years ago. Um, we, she lived with me for a while, my wife and I, while we were interviewing her to, um, uh, to, to get all of her story, as much as we could do, at her request particularly. She had stigmata over two Easter periods in particular. She bled profusely. Stigmata, perhaps I should uh, give it more in context here. Stigmata, the manifestation, the spontaneous manifestation of the wounds of Christ's crucifixion, appearing in uh, always, uh, pretty well always, religious people. Other forms of stigmata have appeared to non-religious people and so on, burn marks in, on the wrists for people who have been um, uh, traumatized in concentration camps and so on. But this is a particular thing that happens for deeply religious people. 
Um, she had a clear belief about what her stigmata was. She was a, a healer, she, was, she had a healing ministry, and she believed that this was Christ advertising. It was his neon sign. It was saying, look at this person because this person is continuing my healing ministry. That was her clear view. All stigmatics have a kind of a view of Christ's in intervention here. They don't all have the same one. Um, uh, for one thing, uh, George Hamilton in Scotland, who I interviewed as well, it was completely mystified. He knew that Christ was giving him a job to do. He probably just couldn't figure out what the job was. And he, he had a, a, a picture on his wall of, of the first stigmatic, St. Francis of Assisi, whose question was, um, what is it you want of me, God? And, and George felt the same way. Heather was not in that case. Heather was quite clear about what it was. She had the same kind of artistic after effects as did Peter and so many close encounter uh, people. After this experience, she started to have to paint or to channel writing. One of the people that watched her channeling said it was like when you watch the Superman movie and you see his hand moving so fast. Couldn't believe that this neat writing was coming so fast. Many of you will be aware of channeling and so on. You've probably seen or, 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 or heard of that kind of effect again. So again, we have an overlap here with the close encounter type people and so on. What was quite significant was she had a cancer. She had very serious cancer, and um, I, I'm glad I'm doing the talk before lunch because it would probably go down very well after lunch. When I described to you her body was so riddled with cancer, so many organs had to be removed from her body that in fact she had to periodically go down to the hospital where they would insert 80, 87 feet, I'm sure she said, of surgically prepared um, bandages and gauzes into her body just to give her a body shape. So many bits were missing, as it were. Now, when she got the stigmata, and this went on for many years, um, when she got the stigmata, this brought the kind of attention to her healing ministry that she so wanted. Now, shortly after, the, after her two periods of stigmata, she died. She may have taken her own life. She was found in the river where she used to go and pray and so on. Um, the coroner actually brought in a verdict of accidental death with a very cold night, so it, it's uncertain. But the coroner did many examinations on her, particularly when he found out who she was. She had been quite a local celebrity. She'd been in the press, she'd been on the local papers and so on. And when he realised who it was, and he had an interest in the subject, I had a long, long meetings with the coroner after this as well, um, he had a real interest in the subject. He actually recalled the body after he'd done his initial examination, specifically to look at the stigmata areas of her body to see if he could determine anything from that. And two really incredible things came out of it. The first, almost, was the simplest thing. The stigmata, he said, was not artificial. He could find no evidence of mechanical damage. She hadn't been creating wounds by scratching herself with with pens or anything like that. She'd been bleeding, as it were, not long before her death, and yet there was no mechanical damage to her, to her uh, wrists or feet. Um, also, there was no dyes or other substances in the skin which would have given it the red marks or anything like that. He was satisfied that, that in fact, there was no reason for her to bleed, and she bled very publicly, she was a film bleeding and so on. Also, her doctor, an NHS doctor, had given him a report which he was able to show me, I believe quite legally, he seemed, he seemed quite relaxed about it anyway. Um, and it said that he believed that these marks were spontaneous lesions for which I can give no account. Now that I think from a, from a doctor is, is quite a, a, a statement. I mean that was quite, he was mystified. More significantly I thought, she had absolutely no trace of cancer whatsoever in her body at all after this death, which was not long after she had had all the, the, the cancers and she was still going for cancer treatment and so on. What does it prove? For me, it proves the power of the mind. Simple as that. But I think with enough belief and conviction, you can actually physically change your body. And possibly, as we'll talk about in a few other cases, maybe even project a bit further than that too, but certainly change your body. She was very much a, a natural stigmatic. There have been fakes, there have been, uh, as in all these subjects, there have been people that have been claiming fakes. I have spent a long time with her. I saw all this going on. She was filmed in the most profuse bleeding kinds. She was filmed very, you know, right throughout periods to where you would see whether she was kind of damaging her hands or whatever else. The doctors were quite satisfied, the coroner was satisfied, there was no damage of that sort. I think this is what you call a genuine case. And if it is a genuine case, then what it amounts to is, because of her incredible belief 
And her belief amounted to the fact that she thought she was somehow, and it seemed very rational to her, she was inside the body of Christ at the time of his crucifixion, which is why she had the same wounds he had. Um, with that incredible belief, your mind can do things to your body, as it were. And of course, we can then look at, you know, can you heal, well, she did heal a cancer perhaps, or at least it seems to have gone away, but can you hold off illness, can you create illness, etc., etc. I think this case is one that proves that there is something to be investigated. Remember the core of why I'm doing this, this, this talk is, I think science should not be so glib about dismissing the paranormal, including the UFO and closing counter cases, and I think that's a case that shows they should not be so glib in doing so. The next one, oops, a nice, simple piece of poltergeistery, or haunting, or whichever, but one which impressed me. In the Union Inn in Rye, in Sussex, um, the, we were asked to go there as a team, there was an ASAP team, of uh, ASAP is our sister organisation, uh, investigating the general paranormal, as it were. There was, a, I think, well, several teams, but one, particularly when all this was going on, was eight of us. And things happened while we were there, which is actually very rare. I, I spent ages in castles and everything else, and the, the, the biggest danger is falling asleep. I mean, it really is, that's the, the greatest fight you have all, all night on ghost watches and so on, is falling asleep. But here we actually had some stuff happen. And it happened in front of lots of witnesses, which was quite nice. One was a door moving in a very, very curious way. And it was kind of just flapping backwards and forwards with absolute precision at both ends of the movement. No one near it. In fact, a lot of monitoring equipment around it to, to determine what might be affecting it. Um, difficult, perhaps, to describe to you how weird that was, but I can assure you all of us were kind of looking around thinking that doesn't look natural. Um, and shadows under a door. If I can describe roughly this, what was going on, and this is really only to set the scene for what happened a bit afterwards, but the, there was a lot of building work going on, so there was a very large gap under the door, and there was a light on in the room behind the door. So in the room where we were all sitting, we could see this very large light, sort of long light coming out of the door, and we could very clearly see the heads and shoulders of two people moving around in that light, in that room, very clearly. But we also had a camera on another door at the side, pointing into the room, and that as we were watching the figures, we could also watch a monitor screen showing absolutely nothing going on in the room at all. We had the room completely covered. I was the one appointed to go up and open the door and ask these people what they were doing invisibly in the room. And I, everyone, I couldn't see it then from my perspective, but everyone else was quite unanimous. As I touched the door handle, the light stayed on, but the shadows turned off like that. And of course, I opened the door, there was nothing in there. Um, and that's one of the problems of the paranormal, because I could bring you the tape and prove to you that there was nothing going on in that room at all, and maybe that doesn't prove very much from your point of view. But you had a lot of people looking at that. The pub owner, who the union in, uh, manager and owner, had asked us down there, and he wanted rid of this thing. And we kind of done a deal with him, where if we could have a few sessions looking at it and monitoring it and whatever else, then we'd also try and get rid of it for it. Um, I'm no exorcist and, and certainly don't try that. But we did arrange with what amounted to a kind of new age exorcists to come down, and they were going to place crystals around the place. Now when they arrived, and I thought this was quite crucial in a way, and, I, and it turned out I was wrong, the pub owner absolutely I wouldn't say hated them, but he wanted bell, book, and candle. He thought he was getting the whole kind of, you know, church service. And when these guys in suits turned up with a case full of crystals, I mean, I just thought this is doomed to failure because I've always believed you had to kind of buy into this stuff to make it work. And I thought, he's not buying into this at all. Well, they planted their crystals, etc. And several years later, when I kept checking in with him, that this thing had never reoccurred. The complete had been completely cleared out, and even he was amazed at that fact. But the thing that I particularly, and the, and the reason for putting Postman Pat down the bottom there, the thing that I was really impressed by was that clearly we changed the dynamic of that room. Now, I don't know if the things being seen, there were apparitions, one of them seen by a young child with a very blue figure, that's why we, he called him Postman Pat, blue. Um, and there were forms seen in the rooms, and there were movements and poltergeist activity and so on. Very classical stuff in a way. The child was very young and wasn't there at the time of the exorcism. They also had a house in Drive down the road, and the whole family, apart from the, the, the pub owner Stephen, was, was down at the house. And he wasn't, the child wasn't told about all this. But he wasn't that worried about Postman Pat. In fact, it was a kind of an imaginary friend, except in this case, one that other people could see as well. Um, and he was quite at ease with it. They did the exorcism. The very next day, the family came back, 
and the child was in obvious kind of distress, running all over the place and, and kind of up and down the place. Eventually he came back to the whole group, to his father and so on, and he said, I can't find Postman Pat anywhere, I don't know where he's gone. And he never did reappear. Now, as I say, I'm not putting it to you that, that this was an objective dead person roaming about, if that's one interpretation of a ghost or whatever else. What I am saying here is that we had, to me, pretty good evidence that somehow the things that we did in that place changed the dynamic of that room. Because this child, who really wouldn't have known what was going on, he just told us straight that there was a big change in the environment as he saw it. And for me, again, as I say, proves no more, or no less, that something real must have happened in, in what we were doing. And therefore, there is something that was happening in that place, whether if you call it a haunting or a ghost or whatever, something real happened. And so it's a case that I put to you and say, this kind of thing shows that we should still be examining this subject. The next one's a bit more personal. A creative ghost. I promised you it wasn't the famous Philip. Um, also subtitled Five Go Mad in Child. There was another ASAP team, of which I was one of the five. It's a very simple little story. The five of us were in Charlton House, which is the building you see there. It's um, an old Jacobean mansion. It's now a a local community centre, and they, they sort of love ghost hunts and so on. So they always allowed ASAP to use the place for its uh, meetings, its trainings, its various kind of seance work and all the rest of it. They're very open to it. We are actually part of their tour. Um, sometimes they invite us to come along, and we're actually trying to stake out with all our equipment up and down the staircases and so on. And then they send the tours round, and the tour guides are actually saying, this is our ghost team that comes in every now and again. So we're actually part of the tour. Yeah? That's how easy, at ease they are with us. Um, and basically what we were doing was nothing to do with ghosts. We were there replicating table tilting, battle doors work on seancing and making tables, lift and all the rest of it. Absolutely nothing of which we succeeded to do, I have to tell you. Um, we, we got in contact with one person on Ouija, and it turned out that one of us, not me in this case, recognised the person that they were in contact with was a fictional character they were creating for a screenplay. Now, I'm not telling you what that means or what doesn't mean, but it just showed something kind of was happening there. Um, but what was the point of my, my bit here was that about, I think it was about three or four in the morning, I was just sitting in the, in the circle doing the stuff, and I saw a figure a pe appear at the end of the room. Now, we had the room controlled, the rooms were sealed, we were the only five in there anyway, and there was a figure appeared at the end of the room. And I thought, well, okay, that's what we're here for, maybe, you know, in a way. I didn't shout out, has anybody seen the ghost? Because that's not really the best objective way to get uh, the rest of it involved. I just made a quick little note that I, what I'd seen and what time it was. When we debriefed, three of us had reported on our little notepads a figure at the end of the room. One other person at the same time said they felt something strange. And one person, absolutely nothing whatsoever. Now, again, I can't tell you what it means. Perhaps a real ghost just appeared at the end of the room. Perhaps I created one and others could see it. Perhaps we collectively created it. Perhaps someone else created it and I was one of those that also saw it. Or perhaps something completely different that I can't even think about and you might have ideas about that I've never thought about. The point again is it seemed to me that as near to objective as we could, something appeared. We didn't complain about it until afterwards. We all, so several of us detected it in some way or saw it, and it seems to me that that shows there is something to be investigated. That's all I'm saying up here. I'm not saying it's this, it's that, I interpret it as this, but that's something to be investigated, something science should take seriously. My next case is kind of very odd, crop circles. And this is not about crop circles, I've got to tell you this. It's just it makes it a lovely picture. I was at a, a crop circle site, and I, I was actually with Walt Andrus, who was then the head of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network in America. And I wanted to do an interview, it was as simple as that. He was very into crop circles, we happened to be down there with other people looking at crop circles, so he thought, why don't we film the interview in the crop circle, just for kind of atmosphere, nothing more than that, I promise you. So we stuck Walt in there, we got the camera in there, and the camera just died. We could not film at all in the crop circle. So we took the camera out, changed the battery, the battery came back again, we took it back in, went dead. We checked the spare battery, it was fine. We put it in, we went in back in the crop circle, it went dead again. Now, I'll jump the important bit and tell you that that's not unique in, in this kind of research. 
Hedy Burks, a uh, psychic medium that many of you may know about in Ghost Research, he's uh, written one book and certainly done a lot of high profile work. He said he'd been in several places where this had happened. He tried to film in Byron's room, I think he told me it was. And um, whenever he took the camera in there, the lights would fail and he couldn't film in there and so on. I've done a poltergeist investigation with a team from ASAP again in, in a house in Hertfordshire where we had several instrument failures as soon as we, we tried to do anything, including what you call clumsy instrument failures, like me putting the wrong tape in and that tape running out, a shorter tape than it should have been, and running out just before the event actually happened and so on. And it's kind of like poltergeists play with you. Like, I really don't want to make it sound like it was a them and an us, because it may all be us, but something happens here. Anyway, this was going on in this crop circle. Now, the important thing about this crop circle is we only picked it because no one else was in it, because we could get some filming done, because we knew it was a fake. We knew who'd done it, and we knew when they'd done it, and why they'd done it. It just happened to be a very nice one, so we thought we'd do it. So if we knew before we started that this one, whatever the others may or may not be, this one was a fake. And yet we had all these instrument failures going on in there while we were trying to do it. What does that tell you? I haven't got a clue. Perhaps the person that did the fake was somehow driven to this high energy place and just did the fake there without knowing why he picked it. Perhaps in faking it, he left something there. Perhaps we invested something into the whole process and the crop circle was completely irrelevant. I don't know. But I do know that these things do happen. Scientists hate this. When you say, you know, investigate this, but if you, if you try and investigate it scientifically, it won't fail when they come around. The lights just won't go down when they're doing an objective test. And they just laugh at you and say, you know, are you really trying to fool us with this? Well, I have done enough of this work, I have had this happen, I know I'm not lying whether they think I am or not, and I can't explain it, but it, for me, is a, is a process that we need to, to understand. I will give you a guess, and it's actually not my guess, it's my wife's guess. When we go to uh, ghost watches particularly, we have a fight, my wife and I. I prefer to go with every piece of equipment. I look like NASA just landed. I like everything there because if anything happens, I want to film it and I want to bring it here to you and show you what I filmed. My wife says, I couldn't care less about that. I want to know if this thing is real. I'm happy to go in with no instrumentation whatsoever because if it happens, then I'll know it's real or whatever. Now this is a debate we have and I kind of sympathize with both of you as it were. But the point might be, as or her point is, that we look at things differently when we have instruments and when we don't. When we don't have any instruments, we, we have to use our eyes and our brains and our senses and so on. And it's possibly some part of that that we can turn off, which perceives, let's say, a paranormal, whether we create it or whether it's actually out there. When we've got all our instruments, we just keep looking at the monitor screens or we're looking at the flips going up and down or whatever else. Our brain is very, very left brain, using my previous breakdown, because we're looking at instrumentation, we're expecting things to appear. I think her view is it's very right brain to go in with no equipment because then you're open to whatever's going to happen there. And I can't tell you which of those is better, which of them is more scientific, which of them is more likely to get results. All I can say is it again seems to show that there's a something that deserves having a look at. And again, to remind you that that's why I'm bringing these cases up, because I think we must be cautious of accepting science too readily. I, I'm not opposed to science. It must be brought to bear on subject, but we mustn't allow it to become a religion any more than our own subject can sometimes look like one. Treasurer's House, classic ghost. Um, I'll just run, I'll run through it very quickly because it's so well known anyway. It's um, the basement, that is the basement there in uh, the Treasurer's House is in York, next to near the York Minster. And Harry Martindale in 1953 was in this, he was then a plumber, he, was, he then became a policeman later in life, he was at that time a plumber. He was in the basement fitting in some piping and he suddenly heard a bugle sound, turned and through the wall came an entire Roman legion, walking straight through the, through the, the, the cellar and straight out again the other side. Um, subsequent investigation showed that they were actually walking on an old Roman road. He actually saw them, they appeared to be their knees were on the ground and their legs had disappeared, but they went through part of the excavation where he could see them walking on the actual Roman road itself, which is one thing. He also gave descriptions of parts of their battle dress and so on, and, um, uh, and they didn't tie up with either the Hollywood images or what was believed to be, at that time, what they would wear. It was sometime, quite a long time after his report, that they discovered that actually in that place at the time were 
uh, units of um, a kind of mercenary group that did use the kind of equipment he described. Also, he said they looked pretty tired and dishevelled. I won't use the exact words that, that he kind of described it, but um, they weren't at their best, shall we say. And again, the reports appear to indicate that they had had a bit of a, or there were several times when units had had a bit of a beating and were coming back pretty um, unhappy. There had been previous claims. When Martindale went up, he was a young teenager at the time, when he ran up uh, pretty alarmed at what he'd seen to the curator at the time of the treasurer's house, and apparently he didn't even say a word. He was just kind of breathing and looking like a bat. And the curator said, oh, you've seen the Romans, have you? And there had been several other reports of other people seeing the Romans. Uh, Mawson, four years later, also was in the cellar, also saw twice, uh, Joan Mawson was another person working in the treasure house, um, saw these Romans walking through the cellar, not actually in the same direction, but walking in a different direction, and it turns out that they were also walking on an old Roman road as well, but all going on down there. What does it mean? For me, it just means the ghosts are real. Now, it doesn't mean that they're dead people. This particular type of ghost, I would think, if, it, you know, if, if it's uh, correct, is what I would call a recordings-type ghost. A real Roman legion once walked through there, and or walked along that road before that building was built, and somehow something embedded that thing into the fabric of the atmosphere, or the building, or the road, or whatever, just like you can record something on a video recorder, and something press the playback button. It must be something fairly unique, or we'd have ghosts running all over the place everywhere, because obviously everywhere has had a history. This room must have been a Roman place at some time or whatever. Um, it takes some unique circumstance, presumably, to embed the recording, some unique circumstance to re-trigger the recording, but re place, reports like this one, well documented, lots of different witnesses, uh, suggest to me that there is a real phenomenon we call recording of ghosts, whatever else ghosts might not like for all the time. And he suddenly saw a bright green object around him, circling the plane, getting nearer, coming away. As it approached the plane, so the ground controller, I and mean, it's all recorded, you can listen to the, the communications that he, um, uh, that he had, you can hear a kind of crackling like something is interfering with proximity of the UFO, something was interfering with the plane. He continued flying. He said, I'm just picking out bits of quotes, it seems to me that it's playing some sort of game. It's got a green light, it's sort of metallic and shiny on the outside. Um, the engine was rough idling. Uh, at some point there was a, 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 a sound described as metallic. They lost contact and 1978 Bounties had never been seen again. Now, Obviously, there are beliefs. There's, there's a kind of conspiracy theory that Valentich actually faked his own death, and he's, you know, working in a petrol station along with Elvis and Lord Lucan and everybody else, or that other people had killed him for this reason or that reason. There were, you know, he, he didn't phone ahead to Morabin Airport where he was going to turn on the landing lights, and he was going to arrive in the dark. That was very silly. I've done. I've been in private planes and so on, and it's actually much more of a shambles than you'd think. So it doesn't surprise me that things could go wrong. Whether there's conspiracy or not, the point here, if we just go back to the basics, you have a pilot, you have him in touch with the ground, you have a description of something that is clearly a UFO, in the sense of it's an unidentified object flying somewhere in the atmosphere, and, and he's dead. Now, he's been sucked up by an alien and taken away in an abduction, maybe. Maybe he's just crashed into the, the straits. I would favour that. I would favour that basically whatever this thing did, it interfered with the plane and the plane crashed. It may be just a natural energy source, some kind of super ball lightning, whatever else. It doesn't have to be alien or transdimensional or whatever else, but it could be. But so long as he's dead, doesn't turn up, and so long as something that is clearly a UFO brought him down, and something that we don't understand in terms of normal meteorology and so on, then I say we've still got a subject to study, because that's part of the UFO subject. And obviously we could weed out all kinds of other cases that have different mysteries attached to them, but that is still very much a mystery. My next sort of major case, as it were, <coughs> is famous poltergeist case in Sorkin in Scotland. Virginia Campbell, this is 1960, reported in, in a great many newspapers and so on at the time. It was well known at the time it was going on, so much so that the school actually employed, not employed, but asked someone that looked like Virginia Campbell to occasionally specifically sort of dress like Virginia Campbell and leave the school and send the whole press pack with her just so that the real Virginia Campbell could get out of the school and go home occasionally. That was how popular it was and how well known it was. 
very many witnesses, if I just run off the list of witnesses, the Reverend Lund, Minister of the Church of Scotland, W.H. Nesbitt, a physician, Dr. Logan, also a physician, Dr. Logan's wife, herself also a physician, Miss Margaret Stewart, um, her teacher at uh, Salkey Primary School, and, and Margaret Stewart I've interviewed, and I know Malcolm's here today somewhere up there, and I know Malcolm's interviewed her as well, and I think Malcolm came much to the same conclusion as me, whatever else uh, you could say about the case, she was a very down-to-earth, straight, sensible woman who was really trying to report what was happening at the most sensible level. Many, many incidences, couldn't really go through them all now, but of particular uh, importance, in the school itself, I mean, there were a lot of kind of events around her, her bedroom at home, which was witnessed by the doctors and the reverend and so on. And she was unhappy at home because she'd been moved from Ireland to her family in Scotland. She'd had to, she'd left her own room in Ireland. She had to share a bed, even let alone a room, with her cousin in Scotland. She wasn't happy about all that kind of stuff. But in the school, on one occasion, and I'll just quote this directly from Miss Stewart herself, and this was uh, 1994, she was then describing this. First time I became aware of something strange was when I had given the class an essay to do. The class was quiet and all the children had their heads bent down over their jotters, busy writing away. In 1960, we still had the old school desk which had a lid top. I looked at Virginia, she noticed, uh, I noticed she was sitting with both hands pressed firmly down on top of the desk lid. I rose from my chair and walked over to Virginia. I was surprised to see the desk lid rise and fall and Virginia doing her best to keep the lid shut with her hands. The child in front of Virginia left her desk to take a jotter to Miss Stewart's desk and the desk rose a few inches off the floor. More, I think, significantly, and she says it herself, the most unnerving thing, this is Stuart again, I experienced in the classroom was I was sitting behind my large oak table, the teacher's desk. Virginia was standing on the other side with her hands clasped firmly behind her back. A large blackboard pointer cane laying on my table started to vibrate. At first it vibrated slowly, then increased as the seconds wore on. Uh, then the table, which was quite a heavy one, started to rise up slowly in the air and also vibrate. I put my hands on the table and tried to push it down, but with no success. This is the teacher, bear in mind, we're talking about. I was horrified. It didn't stop there. The table continued to vibrate as it hovered a few inches off the floor. Then the table rotated 90 degrees to, the, to that where it had been before, so that the long edge of the table was against me. The table had rotated, so sorry, narrow edge was now directly in front of my stomach. I looked up at Virginia and I saw she was quite distressed and I remember her saying, please miss, I'm not doing that, honest I'm not. And there were many, many other events. Now, several people, including Ms. Stewart, noticed that they peaked every 28 days at the exact point of um, Virginia's emerging menstrual cycle, which may have been some kind of part of the energy that was involved in that way. Now, I can imagine... James Randi getting hold of particularly the first one with the desk lid going up, saying, yeah, well, you can hold the desk and make it come up in here and so on. I defy anyone to say that you could take a class of 30 people plus a fairly intelligent teacher and make a heavy oak desk stand up and do turn around and fall down. You might fake it if you had the special effects team that the Bond films are useful with. You're not going to do it with a 14-year-old girl. I just don't believe that for a moment. Um, particularly with an intelligent teacher in the room. Also, I can think of the odd reason why a desk might suddenly start vibrating and so on, if there was some kind of heavy work going on outside, whatever else. But there wasn't, but apart from that, this takes place in the context of all those witnesses seeing all these things happening to Virginia in the school and at home and so on. For me, that's a clear case of poltergeists. Now, whether it's her generating it, it seems to be, since it's commensurate with her menstrual cycle, um, and maybe that's what poltergeists are. Maybe it's just something we generate out of ourselves. But whatever that is, it's paranormal. Whatever it is, it's worthy of investigation, in my view. And I think it's a very, very solid case. I think we should always be cautious of poltergeists. They are kind of, or can be easy to fake. And it does happen. In fact, at Enfield, where Morris Gross investigated, he said he knew the kids were faking some stuff. But as he himself put it, if something really interesting is going on and attracting a lot of attention, the kids are bound to fake it to make a bit more happen. It doesn't mean there wasn't something really there that triggered it in the first place. This case, I think, is very solid. And I think it's, if you like, it's that one white crow. If it's the only one, it proves something's worthy of investigation. The very last thing is a very personal thing. And actually, it, it, it doesn't prove very much other than probably extreme coincidence. But it just goes to show how coincidental it can be. I start out by telling you that I am psychic as a brick. 
I really, you know, I can't detect what I'm thinking in my own mind sometimes, I don't mind anybody else's, so don't sort of think of me as a psychic in any way. I was going, and this was, and this was nothing to do with, with my work or whatever, this was um, a management training centre, as Lionel said, I'm an accountant, apologies for that, but there you go. Um, so sometimes I have to do all that kind of left brain stuff, and I was going to a meeting of a load of accountants, but it was a kind of, there's a, it, it's actually basically a lot of actors doing training is where I was going, and, and it's a business thing, I I'm, do a lot of their accountancy work, I also do some of their training work, but I don't want accountancy stuff. Anyway, we were all going there, and we were all told to bring a gift, this was a weekend course, we were all told to bring a gift, valued under £10, we weren't told why, or who it was for, it wouldn't have surprised me to find that we had to give the gift to ourselves. They're a bit kind of new agey or whatever else. Anyway, I bought my little gift. Now, in order to get it, I had to figure out, well, why? What am I going to buy for 10 quid? Where am I going to go? So I went to a place in, in Harpenden, where I live, and I decided to play a game. And I, I totally confess, it was just playing a game. This was not any part of my work or for books or anything else. And I thought, so many people have told me not to to find the gift, but let the gift find you. So I'll do that. I'll walk around the shop and I'll just kind of put my hand out and I'll wait and see if I get a different feeling, hot, cold, whatever else. I didn't for quite a long time. But anyway, I kept playing this thing and I actually got a weird feeling when I got to this kind of little box. It was like a little jewellery box thing. And it was a real kind of sparkling feeling in my hands and kind of a warmth and all that kind of stuff that the mediums tell you about. And I thought, well, I've got to get it. I mean, if only because I'm sick of standing here with everyone else looking at me, what the hell am I doing? So I bought this, this box and I went off to this course and it turned out that we were going to be angels and mortals. Every one of us was going to be somebody's angel and what you would do for the course was spontaneous acts of nice things, like you'd leave a cup of tea outside their room in the morning and knock on the door and run away and they'd have a nice cup of tea. I tell you, it's a kind of weird group, but there you go. Um, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, in the end of it all, the angels had to then give the mortals their gift. So I would get a gift from the person who was my angel, I would give a gift to the person who I was their mortal, I was their angel. I of course knew who my mortal was, but I didn't know who my angel was. And, and she didn't know who I was. So a good time came, I gave her the little thing, and she was actually stunned by this thing, because it turns out that what this, this little jewellery box was, it, it had a little carving on the top, and I'm just making sure I get this right, it, it was a, a replica of the lid of the, on, on a grave, a famous grave apparently, in this little town where this girl was born. And she loves this little image, and, she, and it's her churchyard in the little town. Now, I didn't know who I was going to give the gift to. I didn't even know she was going to be at the weekend particularly. But it turned out that, that I gave her this thing, and it was something very, very relevant to her. And I really can't tell you what that means, except for perhaps extraordinary um, coincidence or or my one burst of psychic ability in my entire life, I would imagine. But I thought I'd just share that one, I mean, in the case of that at least keeps me interested when things like that happen, even if it won't interest the scientists or James Randi. But I hope that the cases that I've put to you justify that we, as a society, and as our as sister society, do have a job to do in the face of all the kind of ridicule of science and so on. I think our subject is still very valid. Thank you. Now that you ask, I wish I'd never put it up there. Um, this was another part of, that was the group that I was talking about. The girl in question, I think, is in the group. I can't remember where. But um, part of the other things that we did was to go up on an Iron Age fort and meditate up there all day. Um, so you'd be surprised what accountants get up to when they... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, sure. If anybody's got a question, uh, can we have some lights on a bit more, Matthew? Thank you. Uh, let me come to you with a microphone so everybody else uh, can hear your question. Can you please raise your hand if you've got any questions? <coughs> please, yes, thank you. I've got a simple one. I'll just say it. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. What is that sound? Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. ASAP stands for the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. And just, just to, to sort of give you a little humour into that, I'm told that at the, one of the inaugural meetings, Hilary Evans, who is one of its founder members, says what he said was, what we need is a name which now encompasses an association for the scientific study of anomalous phenomena. And everyone thought he was suggesting it as a name and they adopted it. And he says, I didn't mean that at all, I just meant that's what we ought to be. Anyway. Yeah, maybe at the front. The, um, the question that I asked earlier, if you had a hundred reports, I know it's very difficult 
to actually be specific about this. But out of those hundred, how many people would be lunatics? How many people would be liars? How many people would you genuinely think there's a real chance they're telling the truth? And what do you actually do to find out whether they're people you can really stand a good chance of believing what they're saying? Um, that's a difficult one. I, I, I have certainly come across, I mean, I've probably investigated, uh, you're talking about close encounters more than, or, or any of this. Um, well, I, I, I couldn't even begin to count how many cases I've been personally involved in in, in all of these subjects, I mean, over I mean, probably 30 years now. Um, and I have certainly met people that I think probably you know, need doctors more than they need me, but a very small number. I've certainly met people who are lying to me, and, and, and indeed, one of the kind of classic tests, if you like, and why, why, for example, Harry Martindale in the Treasurer's House, I think, you know, passes the test enormously, is that there are those kind of people who every time they tell it to you, they, it, it gets better. Um, and you think, well, wait a minute, you know, even if there is a core story here, there's a lot of your imagination working in this, you know. Martindale, I don't think, has changed his story once in, in 40 years or something, you know. Um, the vast majority, I would say, of the people that I've spoken to are sincere and they're genuinely reporting something that has had happened to them. Now, you, you, you get into a whole new lecture if I start going on too far about it, but you know, it's, it's my view that a lot of those people are not experiencing involved now. I mean, I'm not even sure that there are such things as aliens coming to Earth and flying saucers to do abductions. I mean, that's kind of different from are there UFOs, are there that kind of thing. I'm not decrying it either, but I think there's a lot of internal stuff goes on here. If I had to sort of encapsulate it very quickly, I would say that you have to look at near-death experience. You have to look at the shamanic journeys and the underground with the power animals and so on. And you realise that when people are telling you abduction stories, they're telling you something very similar. And I think they are having an experience, a genuine experience, and they're doing their best to explain it. And we are putting it into a context where, you know, when you, when you talk to people who have collected these reports in non-technological cultures, they've collected them in a non-technological way, and they talk about the gods and the ancestors and so on. And we tend to talk about UFOs, but, you know, we've got Star Trek, and we've got the Space Shuttle, and all that kind of stuff. And I think it colours our interpretation. Um, and it may colour it so much that it makes it easy for sceptics to say, this is ridiculous. And, and in a way, the interpretations could be ridiculous. But I've not found many people where I think they're ridiculous. I think actually they are genuinely having an experience and it's our job to find out what it is. And I think that's even easier with ghosts and poltergeists and so on. UFOs, which is our main subject here today, which I think you'll be hearing almost all about uh, here, UFOs really have a changing history. They've only been going 50 years, if you take the view of 1947 being the trigger. Of course it goes back way, way past that in terms of anomalous lights and so on and, and experiences. But you've got this kind of thing that started in 47 as a media focus, it took it out of the normal range of the paranormal. And it has evolved. Um, I did one book, uh, which is actually that one right there in front of you, which actually talks about the social, political and cultural influences on UFOs. And you can see that, that although the UFO may be a very real thing, it has changed as society has changed. And I think to some degree, you know, again, it's our interpretations. With ghosts and poltergeists, I can get you reports exactly the same as Martindale's, going back into Roman writing and going back, you know, 2,000 year history, unchanged. Poltergeists using the local material. Okay, now they use computers, they couldn't do that in Roman times, but they're just using what's locally available, as it were. So, so I think there's a genuine experience going on here, and I, and I don't think most of the people that, that report to me are, are overtly lying or are crazy. I think they're having a genuine experience. Our job is to find out what it is, and I think we, we shouldn't be too glib about thinking we've got it just because it looks right. You know, we've, we've got cultural influence, for example. But I, no, I would say a high proportion of sincere people. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, oh, sorry. Question? I'll go over here first. I'll come back in a second. Thank you. The last two questions, I think. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there's a lot of people who are lying to you. Yeah. Um, what is the most. Um, What's the most common type of phenomenon in terms of ghosts? Is it the physical type or is it the transparent sort of spectrum? Well, you may be kind of shocked by that, but the most common reports that were uh, catalogued were apparitional figures, but of people who were still alive at the time they were seen. 
So, the, so although we popularly think of ghosts as apparitions, and indeed that's the Hollywood image, and we popularly think of them as the return of the dead, actually there are a, you know, a vast number of reports of so-called doppelgangers and outer bodies and so on, where people are actually seen. And indeed, in many cases, you've had the witness say, oh my goodness, I've seen this chap, he must have died, and they find out he's perfectly all right, he's perfectly alive at the time. Um, but apparitions are certainly very high. Sorry. No, they look very physical, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, they don't sort of have that wispy kind of sense. I mean, one person reporting a ghost said that they walked past them on a gravel drive, and they were just walking down the gravel drive, and they knew there was something wrong, they couldn't figure out what it was, and as they got a bit further on, they realised they were making no sound, and they, you couldn't do that on a gravel drive, and they turned around and the person wasn't there. But to all other appearances, they were very solid. Now, I mean, recording within ghosts, recording type ghosts, the sort of the, the Roman Legion, which may not be there in spirit, if you want to take it literally, they may just be a video playback. They are very common. As I say, there are replays of whole battles, but some of the people seen in the battles were still alive. They survived the battle. So it doesn't appear to be a factor of dying. It may be a, a factor of projection or whatever. How common also is the fact that people going to places which don't exist? I'm sorry, going to places which don't exist? Yeah. Time slipping. Yeah. Um, it, well, there are some fairly. Uh, uh, Joan. I've my surname. Um, there's a lady that's collected a lot of time slip stuff, and she's done two or three books. And, and I would say to that degree, there are. It's not rare, but, uh, but it's certainly not the most common type of experience. The classic one would be the ladies at Versailles that went to the Petit Triangle in Versailles and think they were looking at it several hundred years before. There have been similar kinds of cases. Um, People hearing the sounds of the battles at the EF and so on, so audible rather than visual. Sorry? Um, not off the top of my head at the moment, anyway, no. Uh, but I mean, it, it's not an unheard of thing. I mean, it's not the most common form of that kind of phenomena, but it's certainly. Um, but Hastings, the castle at Hastings was seen in full glory as in, its, in its good days, as it were, by a fisherman out of sea or something at one point. Right, we've got time for one last question from this gentleman. Um, What's your question, sir? Yeah, I just wanted to know, um, in your opinion, in abduction cases, would trauma alone be enough to um, trigger the right brain things you're talking about? Do you actually have to have intent? Uh, no. It's, it's traumatic. Trauma alone is probably not the only important factor. In all of the cases I've looked at, be it abductions, close encounters, revelation, miracle work, stigmata, and so on, um, mostly what you find is that the trauma is the triggering event, but you will often find that those people have a lifetime history of kind of suffering or illness or parental abuse or divorce and uh, traumatic divorce and so on. Um, which is not to say, I think, that, that people like, I mean, the, the classic retort against people like me is, oh, well, these are the kind of people that you'd expect to want to sort of be um, attention seeking. And maybe that, does, maybe that is something in it, but I think certainly in Heather's case, who had suffered huge abuses all her life and so on, that was the stigmatic lady I talked about. I think there it wasn't a case of seeking attention so much as that all that had happened to her had really opened her mind to the world. In a sense, she had nothing else to be afraid of, everything had happened to her, so she could afford to explore the world with her mind. And I think she was very open. And most of the, the close encounter and abductees I've spoken to have gone through some kind of really quite, quite hard life, if you like. And, and the trauma then becomes a trigger, but, but there's a background to it. Now, I could also point to plenty of you know, very well-heeled, comfortable, middle-class, easy people who also have these experiences. So we're not talking about, you, you know, it, it's an absolute requirement. But there's a high percentage of that kind of thing in the background. And, the, and the suffering seems to help release the right brain, if you like. Yeah, what I was thinking about was something like the war palettes of World War One. You know, sure, no, so absolutely. Have become creative. Yeah. I wonder whether it was yeah. shocked by an alien experience would have the same thing. So there wasn't an intent on the part of the aliens, whatever they are. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I, I don't have a belief that it is an alien coming along to make us into drummers and, and artists and so on. And you're quite right. The war poets is an example. People who suffer concentration camps actually also manifest their own form of stigmata as well as all the other kinds of things that go on. So yes, the, I, I agree with you know, what you're implying there is absolutely right. Um, there's a whole spectrum here and trauma and kind of problems seem to be what triggers this kind of ability, if you like, this talent either to see or even create these things. Yeah. Right, please show your appreciation much going, ladies and gentlemen.